Hey everyone, uh, here is my Shabbos Haggadol Drasha from 2023 or 5783. And so what I wanted to speak about this year is slavery. Now, of course, you could say, obviously, we talk about slavery. That is one of the major themes of the Haggadah. But I don't necessarily want to talk about slavery as an end of the conversation, but really as a means for thinking about what I think one of the big themes of Pesach and the Seder is. And so in order to, to sort of begin this exploration, um, we have to start with defining what exactly is slavery according to the Torah. So um, we see slavery emerge in a legal context. Interestingly, in Parsha Mishpatim, um, if in that, which is the Parsha of the laws that immediately follows Parsha Yitro, which is when the Israelites received the Torah, Torah shortly after the exodus from Egypt. And so there's lots written about how it's a very, interesting choice to start the laws given to a newly freed people about what happens when they own a slave. Um, and the, the rules there, specifically in Parshat Mishpatim in the beginning, are about the Eved Ivri, the Hebrew slave. And this is someone, this is a fellow Jew, um, uh, someone who has fallen on hard times and has exhausted all other options of paying back a debt. And so the only one that is left is to sell themselves into slavery. And the Torah is very clear. You get a max of six years and the seventh year they go free, right? This is not something that exists for the purpose of the institution of slavery, but rather this is a means of someone who is otherwise at totally at a loss of other options to be able to pay off a debt and then continue with life after that. And there, in Parshat Mishpatim, um, the Torah refers us to this per, to this person as an Eved Ivri, a Hebrew slave. And the sources that I, I used specifically for the purpose of this shear come from Vayikra, chapter 25, Leviticus 25, which talks about the Eved Ivri, and then immediately afterwards, the Eved Kanani, the non-Jewish slave. Um, and so the verses for the Eved Ivri, it's Leviticus 25, verses 39 to 43. Now, interestingly here, it doesn't use the word eved, right? It doesn't use the word slave. It uses the word ach, or your brother. And the Torah says, right? If your brother falls on hard times and is sold to you, don't treat them essentially, don't work them the, the work of a slave, right? Don't treat them like a slave. How instead should you treat them? They should be with you rather like a, a essentially a day laborer, right? So not someone, there's not someone who's well off, but someone who is an independent worker who lives hand to mouth, but at least has the rights and their own access. Um, they're not a slave, right? They have a total independence. So that's how you're supposed to treat them, not like a slave. And then it, the Torah continues, and then he'll return to his family and all of that. Why? Right? Because everyone, they're my slaves, says God, who I took out of Egypt, and therefore they're not going to be treated like slaves. And most importantly, you should not rule over them ruthlessly, right? With this sense of, um, of, of cruelty or perhaps not even cruelty, but when you, I feel like Farah is when you are operating according, you want this person, you are acting according to what you can get from them, right? Your own interest, but not what they need. You don't care how hard they're working. You don't care if they need a break. You don't care if they're miserable. You're just working them according to what you need from them. And that's exactly what you're not allowed to do to the Hebrew sleeps, to the Eved Ivri. And then the Torah immediately segues into speaking about the Eved Kanani, the non-Jewish slave. The Torah says, and your slaves that you're going to have, from the nations that are around you, that's from who you should purchase a slave, you should acquire a slave. All those nations, and also the non-Jewish nations who live amongst you, and they're going to become your property, right? So here the emphasis is clearly, you can have slaves, they're going to be your property. And then the Torah continues. It's going to continue for generations. The whole point is simply that they are not what? They are not Jews, right? They're not Israelites, but that's it. And once they're not Israelites, they're your property. You can, you know, they are your slaves, right? Slaves as we think of it in terms of people who have absolutely no rights and there's no freedom date in sight. 
And then the Torah concludes this little section by reminding us, for your fellow brother from Israel, that is who you should not work befarach, right? You should not work ruthlessly again, which I think though not articulating it explicitly implies that you can work the Eved Kanani befarach, right? If the warning is not to work the, the, the Eved Ibri befarach, then presumably you can work the Eved Kanani befarach. So this sets up, I think, what, what many of us would find when you, when you hear it articulated as explicitly as this and as nakedly as this, it's pretty uncomfortable because the message is slavery is for your fellow, is for the non-Jews out there, right? You and fellow Jews are to be protected from slavery and you may not enslave them, but regarding everybody else, yeah, you know, we don't really, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter what happens to them. They can be your slave and you can do whatever you want to them essentially. And frankly, the Sefer Achinuch articulates it, use that explicitly. He says, why is it that we are allowed to have the Evet Knani or that the rules are more relaxed with the Evet Knani? so that we don't enslave our fellow Jew, right? He sort of assumes that everyone needs to have a slave, right? Which of course, I feel like many of us 48 hours before Pesach feel like, woo, yeah, you know, it's really hard to operate without any domestic help or minimal, certainly without someone who's in your house and has no choice and is there all the time. And so what he, the Sefer Chinuch says is essentially that the Torah, so God says, you know what, you can have slaves from the, from the Kna'anim, from the non-Jews, so that your fellow Jews can't be slaves and therefore they can devote their time to studying and to serving God, right? Because if they're slaves, of course, they don't have the time to do that. And so he argues that's really why we have the institution of the Eved Knani. It's to keep Jews focus free and therefore focused on God. Now, as an example, when you get to the Rambam, who's in the Mishnah Torah, in the end of his long series on the laws of slaves, he takes this and he softens it for us. Already, he is kind of changing the dynamic. How? Because he opens with, this is, a, by the way, chapter nine, um, halacha eight, that it's permissible to have an Eved Knani perform, here the translation is excruciating labor. We can work them at Farich. That's okay. He's articulating what we glean from the Torah, even though the Torah doesn't say it explicitly. Eved Knani, Farich, fine. But then he continues, although that's the law, the attribute of piety and the way of wisdom is for a person to be merciful and to pursue justice. What does that mean? Don't make your slaves carry a heavy yoke. Don't cause them distress. Give them the food and drink that they deserve, right? And basically treat them as a human being, as a dignified human being. Why? Because he continues, cruelty and arrogance are found only among idol worshiping Gentiles, right? Cruelty, treating slaves badly, treating other humans badly, that's for the non-Jews, right? That's for the other people, that's the idol worshipers. But us, we as Jews, we don't do stuff like that, right? He says, we're the descendants of Avraham, and we know that God commands us to treat all living creatures with dignity, with respect. And so essentially what he's saying is, even though technically the Torah does say you can treat your Eved Kanani Befarech, the menschlich thing, the right thing, the godly thing to do, is not to do that. And so I appreciate what the Rambam is saying because what he, you know, what he's basically doing is taking some of that discomfort that the Torah presented us and mitigating it by saying, yeah, okay, you should really, anyone, he's not saying, okay, eradicate slavery, but he's saying eradicate abuse within slavery and that everyone needs to be treated with dignity and with respect. And you therefore, you, you wonder what, what exactly he has in mind with that. And where I wanted to take this specifically today is to then, if you switch over in the Mishnah Torah to his laws of Pesach in 7 um, Halacha 2, he's talking about, he's articulating the vision for the Seder, right? And how does the Seder work? And part of it is that we have to teach the children about the Exodus because the Torah says, we got to tell the Vincha, right? You have to tell your child, you have to tell your son. And so he says, of course, you have to do that. And how do you do that? According to the, the, the personality of the, the child or their knowledge level, so too the father teaches according to that level. How? If the child is little, or this translation is foolish, unintelligent, let's say, right? Doesn't grasp sophisticated concepts. 
Omer Lo, right? Here's how you teach him. Bani, my son, Kulanu Hayinu Avadim, we were all slaves. Kemo Shifchazu O Kemo like that maid servant or that slave. In Egypt, and on that night, Hashem redeemed us and took us out to freedom. Okay, this is something that you could miss if you're just reading the Rambam quickly, but he does something fascinating, right? The story you're supposed to tell the child is, we were all slaves in Egypt and on that night, God redeemed us. But it's almost like he puts it in brackets. We were slaves, like what? like that slave over there, right? He's imagining you're pointing your child, you are pointing to a slave and saying, we were like them one day. Now, this might seem a bit jarring for us because what is the Rambam admitting right here? The Rambam is admitting that this child is living in the presence of slaves, right? That he is living in the presence of slaves. And it's not, you know, I, 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 I think you could say, well, the Rama is pointing to his own kitchen, right? And saying, look at the slave over there. Or maybe just more broadly, and you know, that slave your neighbor has, it could be that. But the point ultimately is that the Rambam is saying you teach the child, the child who cannot grasp complicated concepts yet, you do it through example. And the example is that there's a slave right over there. And I think that, you know, I don't use this, of course, to condemn the Rambam, right? The Rambam, he never said you can't have slaves. And for most of human history, and frankly, even though today we know in certain parts of the world, there still is slavery, right? And so we don't want to be naive in how we read this. But at the same time, I find it fascinating that the Rambam's experience of Pesach is one in which the child is telling the story of the Exodus with slaves in their midst. Because what does that do for us? What that really does is say that the narrative of Pesach is exclusively about the redemption of the Jewish people, the redemption of us as a people, and doesn't have any really other moral lesson behind it, which fr frankly stands in contrast to some some other teachings that there are, you know, one of my favorite teachings uh, is of Nechama Leibovitz, where she says the whole purpose of the Exodus was to condition us to be sensitive to the experience of being strangers, to the experience of vulnerability and powerlessness, and when you are living in someone else's society, so that we never treat anyone else like that. So this is hard for me to, to, to just live in the world of the Rambam and say, okay, he's living in a world in which the story really is about the Jewish redemption, but not anyone else. And yes, we are surrounded by slaves. And so what do we do with this? Um, I think that in some ways that's an issue. I mean, in some ways it's a big issue. I think that it, it but I think at the same time, it has a lot of connections to Pesach in general, right? Because Pesach is all about the process of looking for things that are in some ways right in front of you. And the example I gave in Shul is that when my au pair left a few months ago, she left behind in the mix of her leaving a box of non-kosher Pop-Tarts. I hate throwing food out even if I can't eat it. So that box of Pop-Tarts has been sitting at the top of my basement stairs for three months. And every time I, I sort of see it sometimes, especially when I'm walking up the steps from the basement back to the first floor, that's when it's in my line of vision. And usually I'm carrying something or I'm rushing and I never want it to be the time where I'm gonna throw out food that is still perfectly edible. And so I see it sometimes I say, oh yeah, I gotta deal with that, right? But it's that box of Pop-Tarts is blended into my house, right? It is part of my house right now, the fabric of my house, right? I just see it sometimes, but most of the time it's just there. Now, of course, God willing, before Pesach, I'll remember to actually throw it out because Pesach really is the process of looking around your house, um, looking at the way it looks 364 days of the year and saying, this is the day when you're cleaning, I mean, in advance really, where I'm gonna see the stuff that I haven't seen yet or that I haven't seen in a long time, right? It's when you look for the things around you that otherwise blend into the background.
And I think that's the purpose, that's the physical process of it. And then there's also the spiritual process, the Seder, where something we mention all the time in davening, the Yitzhak Mitzrayim, the Exodus from Egypt, that the Seder is the night where you comb through that story again. You look at all the details of the story. And I bet every year we all find something new that we hadn't really noticed before, right? Pesach is that process of looking around and seeing and saying, what in my world do I take for granted every day as being part of my world or being part of our story? And how can I examine that? How can I, you know, stop seeing, I, I, I stop and I take something that I see as a whole and I start to take it apart and ask questions about it. And I try to see things that I take for granted the rest of the year. And so I kind of wonder how the Rambam would react now in 2023 to his statement in the Mishnah Torah of, yeah, you teach your kid like that slave over there. Would he be proud that he, his children had reference of slavery? Or would he say, wow, I can't believe I lived in a world in which there was slavery and I thought that that was okay. And I think again, not to say that out of judgment, but to just make the point that even when we're sensitized to certain things, we still, there's so much happening right around us that we take for granted and that we don't really even see. And I think that this is part also of the identity crisis that's really happening in Israel right now, because I do think in some ways what's happening in Israel really is an identity crisis. We've got the country split into two. Of course, I'm sure there are people in the middle who don't fully identify with either side, but split into two and fighting over what is the core of our society, right? What are we here for? Do we want legislative you know, checks or do we just want to be able to do what we want without that much check on our power? Right, and clearly those two sides have a pretty clear breakdown in terms of back religious backgrounds, political backgrounds. There's some mix thing, you know, which is good, but but mostly it's just really a split, and it's really an identity crisis. And a lot of that identity crisis is people looking around and saying something that I took for granted as being part of my country might not actually be that way anymore. And now I want to you know fight for that in a new way, in a way that I didn't really think I had to before. And so we see that, you know, Pesach in that sense, I think it's timed very well with Pesach because Pesach is the process of looking around your house and saying, oh, that, that old box of crackers, I really just need to throw it out already. Or that box of Pop-Tarts, let me just get rid of it, right? I'm starting to get used to stuff accumulating. There's this, the communal process of something like Israel where you're saying, oh, all these things I thought that were true of my world and my government and my people aren't really true anymore. And I want to be able to check that. And then there's, of course, the spiritual process of saying all these things that I take for granted every other day of the year, I'm going to now take a pause, take a step back and really think about them and, and consider them. And I think that that's really the process in which you also learn not to take what's right in front of you for granted. And so I hope that this is something that many of you can listen to while you're cleaning or cooking or maybe on the beach in Miami, wherever you are, um, and take a, as a message on all those different levels. And I wish you a Chag Kasher B'Sameach.